Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Two friars were having trouble paying off the belfry, so they opened a florist shop. Everyone wanted to buy flowers from the men of God, so their business boomed. The florist across town, however, saw a huge drop in sales, and so he asked the two friars to close their shop, but they refused. Later, he again asked and even begged them, but they ignored him. So the rival florist then hired Hugh McTaggart. Hugh was the roughest, toughest villain in town, and he was hired to persuade the friars to close. After Hugh asked the friars to close their florist shop and they refused, he threatened them, threatening to beat them up and wreck their shop every day they remained open. So finally, they decided to close. And this proves once and again that Hugh, and only Hugh, can prevent florist friars. And <laughs> nothing will prevent the second coming of Christ. The Word of God has declared it, and the Lord has promised that I will come again. And He will come again at the end of the tribulation. The designation of the second coming needs to be understood in light of God's program with Israel. At His first coming, He came to Israel. At that time, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The us meaning the nation Israel. As the Lord said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At his second coming, this again is in relation to Israel. He will return again to the house of Israel, and his feet in that day will stand on the Mount of Olives. After the battle of Armageddon, Christ will establish his kingdom with Israel as the preeminent nation, and he will reign over all the world from Jerusalem with Israel as the priests of God in that day. But Christ will return seven years earlier than his second coming, returning in the air prior to the beginning of the tribulation to catch the church, the body of Christ, off this earth and to the place of our eternal inheritance in the heavenlies. It is then that God will resume his dealings with mankind through the nation of Israel, and at the end of the tribulation, he will come again to deliver Israel from the Antichrist and to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth. Revelation 19.11 reads, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. In the Apostle John's vision of the future day of the Lord, he wrote, And I saw heaven opened. In Isaiah 64, 1 and 2, we read, O oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow at thy presence to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Israel's hope. Uh, was for God to rend the heavens or to rip the heavens open, to split the sky and to suddenly descend and come down all the way to this earth with power to execute vengeance and to defeat their enemies. God in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, will do exactly that at his second coming. When John saw heaven opened, he beheld a white horse and he that sat upon him. Earlier in Revelation 6, as the tribulation begins, we read of another rider on a white horse, the first horseman of the apocalypse. There we read, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That rider on a white horse will ride onto the stage of the world and he will come to conquer. But the rider in Revelation 6 is the false Christ. 
he attempts to counterfeit God's plans of a worldwide kingdom of peace ruled by the conquering Messiah of Israel. Thus, at the beginning of the tribulation and at the end of it, we have two riders of white horses. The rider at the beginning is the Antichrist, whereas the rider in chapter 19 is the true Christ, the true Messiah of Israel. The true Messiah will return on a white horse to overthrow the false Christ, the Antichrist, and to conquer Israel's enemies. He comes to take control of the earth and to establish his kingdom of peace and righteousness. The one seated on this white war horse is called faithful and true. Faithful and true to his word, Christ will return to this earth in power and great glory. In Mark 13, 26, the Lord had promised his disciples, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. In Revelation 3, 14, the Lord said, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, or the origin and source of the creation. As the Amen and the faithful and true witness, Christ is unchangeably faithful to his word and all his promises, and thus he is rightly called faithful. And the one who is called true is the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. All that he is and all that he does and says is based in truth. But in contrast to him, the Antichrist will be unfaithful to his promises, such as when he breaks a seven-year covenant with Israel during the tribulation. And the beast, the Antichrist, will rule by lies and deception and not truth. The true Christ at this coming comes to judge and make war. And this is what makes this coming so very different from that of the rapture of the church. At the rapture, there is no judgment. There is only the bright hope of Christ raising the bodies of the dead in Christ and catching up the living in the air to take us to heaven before the tribulation. Unlike the rapture, the second coming is all about judgment being poured out against Israel's enemies. And it is about Christ returning to make war, to do battle with the Antichrist and his armies at the battle of Armageddon. Revelation 19, 12 to 13 read, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. As John saw the Lord at his second coming, he observed that his eyes were as a flame of fire. This symbolizes his searching judgment that sees all, all is light before his eyes. His gaze penetrates the hearts and thoughts of people. Hebrews 4.13 reads, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him, with whom we have to do. Christ's judgment is powerful and penetrating as he detects and knows all. Nothing escapes Christ's all-knowing, piercing vision. Therefore, his judgments are always righteous and true. And on his head were many crowns, unlike the Antichrist, who has a crown that is given to him after he rises to power through politics, deception, and force. The true Christ just has many crowns on his head because of who he is as the eternal Son of God. His many royal crowns show his authority, sovereignty, and right to rule the world. And the Lord also had a name written that no man knew but he himself. John saw the name, but he could not comprehend it. In his greatness as Almighty God, there are unfathomable mysteries in his person that even the saints are unable to grasp, but only he, as God, can. John further observed that he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. 
The vesture dipped in blood is not representative of the shed blood of his cross, but rather it is the blood of judgment, the blood of Christ's slaughtered foes. Isaiah 63, 2-3 says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? In thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. I have trodden their wine press alone, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. And his name is called the Word of God. We reveal our minds and hearts to others by our words. And so God the Father reveals himself and his mind and heart to us through his Son. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the express image of his person. As it's been said, since words reveal the thoughts of one person to another, Christ as the eternal word is the revelation of God to man. And John 1.1 1, 1 makes it very clear that the Word of God is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Revelation 19.14-16 read, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Christ is not alone at his return, as the armies of heaven ride with him on white horses. These armies which were in heaven are connected with the Lamb's wife by their apparel, being clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 8 of this chapter reads, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. These are the saints who make up the bride of Christ. And this refers to the believing prophetic saints prior to the dispensation of grace and the martyrs of the tribulation after this dispensation. Angels do return with Christ as well, but Revelation 19.14 refers to the prophetic saints and tribulation martyrs that return with him to reign on the earth. These saints return with, with Christ to partake in the first resurrection, which is their hope. And Jude 1.14 and 15 speaks of them, says, which says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And Zechariah 14, 5 reads, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Members of the body of Christ are not of the number that return with Christ at his second coming. We remain in heaven in our glorified bodies that we receive at the rapture. We have an eternal seated position in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These that come from heaven come unarmed. They are riding upon white horses of victory to be witnesses of Christ's victory and to participate in the joy of his triumph. The weapon that is found in this scene is the sharp sword that goes out of Christ's mouth. And this is a symbol of the word of God. Scripture says that Christ will consume the enemy at his second coming with the spirit of his mouth. The sword from his mouth depicts judgment through the power of his spoken word. And with that sword, he will smite the nations. The battle of Armageddon, with all the nations gathered in that day, will be won by the power of his word. By his spoken word, Christ created all things, and there is infinite power and infinite strength in that sharp sword. Three names are cited at Christ's return. First, the name written that no man knew but he himself. Second, the word of God. And third, King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ has absolute authority over all human rulers. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the truest and greatest sovereign. All kings, all lords, all people must submit to him. In the kingdom he establishes, 
When he returns, he will reign supreme over all earthly rulers. And all the kings and great men of the earth that gather at the battle of Armageddon, they will find out firsthand that Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 17 to 21 reads, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The second coming takes place at the Battle of Armageddon. And in verse 17, I love how God, through one of his angels, declares victory before the battle even begins. The battle will be a slaughter and just a supper for scavenger birds. Christ will slay all who oppose him at this battle. All these kings and captains and mighty men, the, both the free and the bond, the small and the great, all of these people are marked men, meaning they will have all taken the mark of the beast and pledged their loyalty to the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 16 reads, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. The beast and the kings of the earth and their armies will all unite to battle against Christ over world leadership and to try to prevent Christ's kingdom. Verse 19 says that they gathered together to make war. Earlier in Revelation, you read that, and God gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Armageddon has become a byword for the end of the world, but it's not the end. It's the end of the tribulation. It's the end of the Antichrist, but there are events to follow. And Armageddon is a location in Israel where the battle will be fought. Armageddon is the Hebrew name for Mount Megiddo, which is a mount 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Mount Megiddo is located west of the Jordan River in north central Israel, 10 miles south of Nazareth, 15 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. On the plains before Mount Megiddo, many of Israel's battles were fought, including perhaps the most famous when Gideon triumphed over the Midianites with his trumpets, pitchers, and lamps. The Battle of Armageddon will rage at Mount Megiddo and its plain, but it will not be limited to this area only. The battle is described as extending from Armageddon in the north, down through Jerusalem, then ranging down the extreme southernmost part of Israel to Edom, a distance of 200 miles and the battle will spread over nearly the entire land of Israel. The center of the action will be Jerusalem, and that is where Christ returns to. Putting together various scriptures, we are painted a picture of all that will transpire at the Lord's second coming. Daniel 11, 40 to 45, describe a military campaign conducted by the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation. A confederation of nations come up against him at this time. A king of the south is said to push at him, and they gather to attack him. And a king of the north is said to come up against Antichrist like a whirlwind or with great military might. So the Antichrist marches against both of them in a great military campaign. He, inv he invades their countries and absolutely overwhelms them. 
He then sweeps through many other countries and strikes and overthrows Egypt and spoils it. Following this, bad tidings come to him from the east. And I believe that's Babylon, that his precious capital city has been completely destroyed and burned. This news fills him with rage, and he will depart from Egypt with great fury to destroy and annihilate. After this, he overruns Israel, and he goes up and sets up the tabernacles of his palace, or his royal tents, between the seas and the glorious mountain, or between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea at Mount Zion or Jerusalem. The army that will gather at this time will be an army of millions, the largest army ever assembled for one battle. Zechariah 14.2 says, This dreadful army will capture Jerusalem, plunder houses, and take half of the people of Jerusalem captive. And it's at this point that God goads them and provokes them. Joel 3.9 says, God will tell this army, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up to Jerusalem, that is. God tells them to muster. Mobilize all their manpower. Come fully armed, because this will be a fight to the finish. The Antichrist and his army band together against Christ. He invades Israel to utterly destroy it and every person in it, and to go to war against him that sat on the horse, or Jesus Christ. And as he has his tent pitched at Jerusalem, it is at this point that the sun and the moon suddenly darken. Stars from heaven will fall, and the heavens will open, and the Son of Man will appear from above, and every eye will see him. And the Antichrist will then turn his army in battle array against Christ to face him head on. And don't let that get by you. After you've read the description of God Almighty in the person of Christ in Revelation 19, because it takes brazen arrogance, darkened understanding, profound unbelief by the Antichrist and all of these people to make war against the Son of God and to actually believe that they have any chance to defeat Him. Then Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, will come down in power and glory from heaven. He descends all the way to the earth. And Zechariah 14, 4 says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. When Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, it splits. It splits and divides east and west. Part of it moves north, part of it south, and it creates a great valley. And this provides an avenue of escape for the people in Jerusalem to flee. As the battle begins, in an instant, Revelation 19.20 tells us that the world's armies will be without their two leaders. The beast and the false prophet will be captured and immediately by Christ and cast alive into the lake of fire and they become its first two inhabitants. And then Revelation 19, 21 says, and the remnant or the rest of the kings and the armies were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. It is then that the Lord will roar out of Zion, Joel 3, 16 says, and he will crush a great multitude of this confederation by the sword that goes out of his mouth. And as a result of that almighty roar, the heavens and the earth literally shake. And when he roars, much of this confederation melts away. Zechariah 14, 12 says, 
their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Along with this, like in the days of Gideon, the Lord will cause a supernatural confusion, which will send these armies against each other, and they will destroy and kill one another. Zechariah 14, 13 says, A great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Then God further empowers the believing Israelites in and around Jerusalem and Judah. They rally to the defense of Jerusalem and they fight and kill the enemy as well. As Zechariah 14, 14 says, And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem and it will be an absolute bloodbath. Revelation 14.20 says the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even under the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. A horse's bridle is approximately four feet high and blood will also run the distance of 1,600 furlongs, which is around 184 miles. Thus, there will be a river of blood four feet deep, 184 miles long, which is the distance from Mount Megiddo, or Armageddon, in Israel's north, to Edom in the south. The Antichrist's massive army will be crushed and destroyed as was, and as was predicted by the angel, verse 21 says that all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The battle is the Lord's. It is all because of him that this great victory will be won. And as we think of his triumph at the future battle of Armageddon, it reminds us how the battle for our salvation is likewise. It's the Lord's. And he won that most important battle for us over sin and death at his cross and by his resurrection. And when you're on the side of this one, who will return in such power and great glory, it's a reminder for us all that if God be for us, who can be against us? Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.